In late March, the Entertainment Software Association announced that the Electronic Entertainment Expo had been canceled. The move is considered by many to be the nail in the coffin for a convention whose last in-person event occurred in 2019. Joining me is someone who has had plenty of experience at the Expo, former chairman of Sony Interactive Entertainment Worldwide Studios, Sean Layden. Sean, thank you for being here with me today. Hey, Michael, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Glad to be speaking with you. I know you're in the Bay. I'm here in New York. Your weather's probably nicer than mine, but you know what? <laughs> it's always a good time to talk about the gaming industry. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start broad here. What was your reaction to the news that E3 had been canceled this year? Well, to be fair, you know, I exited the formal bit of the video game industry in 2019 at the end of that year. But already by that time, my company, uh, PlayStation, had already pulled out of the 2019 E3. Uh, I think the last E3 that Sony was was a participant in was 2018. Um, at the time, I think the decision was taken because we we're doing fewer games, but bigger games. And the timing just wasn't right to tell the story about any of the stuff we were working on in 2019. So I think the company for, forewent that. And then, of course, pandemic hit and knocked out the next three E3s. And it was going to be difficult to, to, to bring that one back online, I thought, because E3 had sort of... The world had changed since the beginning of E3. The first E3 was 1995, right? And things changed dramatically over that 25-year span. And I don't believe that E3 actually moved on with the times. You mentioned that E3, you feel, didn't move on with the times. What what makes you say that? Well, you got to understand that, you know, E3, which began in 1995, sort of came out of being part of CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. And the game piece was there for a couple of years, but it got so big it needed to be its own thing. So E3 was born in 95. And at that time, you know, video gaming, it was the big time of, you know, Sega, Sega Saturn and uh, the, the original PlayStation. Uh, Xbox wasn't in the business then in 95. Nintendo was still a player at that time. And, you know, I went to my first E3 in 1996. And what I quickly understood was it was a trade show, which means media and retail. And the reason why that was true is that people have to remember that 1995 and 96, that was before the internet, before the, before the World Wide Web was a thing, right? Information super highway. So to get, to get an eyesight on what's going on in the gaming world, you relied on magazines and maybe some newspapers. And the magazines came out on a monthly cadence. And so there's a lot of pent up curiosity about what's happening in gaming. And E3 was a focal point where that all came together. The media came there and then they spread the messages out to gamers across the world. At the same time, retail was just getting in the mood for, you know, what video games are and how do they work in the in, in the retail environment. And I remember being at E3 and having some guy come up and go, hey, I'm so-and-so from Sears. I buy Hot Wheels, VHS, Barbie, and this video game thing. What should I look at? And so you really had an education component with retail. The guy from Sears, the guy from Kmart, the guy from Toys R Us. You know, you had to really teach them about what was the thing to look at? Why was this game more important than that game? When these games coming out, how to hype them up. Sales guys were running around writing business for the holiday season um, with all the different uh, retailers and buyers. And so that's what E3 began as, a chance for the media to have a once time in the year, you know, Tokyo Game Show and Gamescom aside for a moment. But it's real focus, the entire world could come in and see what the gaming industry was doing. And retailers could come in, learn about the product and buy business for Christmas. That's 1995. You fast forward it into 2005 or 2010 or 2015. The internet has already blown up the news piece, right? It's a 24 seven news cycle. If you want to find out what's happening with games, you just log on and somebody, whether it be IGN or, or game industry.biz, they can give you everything you need to know. So that's why sadly so many game magazines folded over that time because the internet really picked up the, the, the information source for gaming on the retail side of things. You know, retailers became more sophisticated. The rise of the independent, you know, game-centric retails like a GameStop became very, very big. And the biggest players, you know, were people like Target and 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 Walmart and uh, Best Buy and GameStop. And gaming became such a big part of their business, they became really invested in, in buying it. So all of a sudden, the game buyer didn't have a multi-portfolio from Hot, Hot Wheels to Barbie. It became the game buyer was the game buyer. So they were really switched on. And companies stopped writing business in June because that was too late and started writing business for Christmas in February and March. So that's how the whole industry shifted over time. But E3 was sort of locked in its 
locked locked in its time bubble. Um, a trade show, traditional you know entries. This is how we do it, and that became a problem for it. There's a lot to digest there, but you mentioned your first C3 was back in '96, mm -hmm. and the gaming industry has become much bigger since then. Pretty much everyone is considered a lot. Billions of people are playing games today. Do you think the industry has almost become too big for an event like E3? Uh, for an event like E3, I think I think if you, if you step back from it, you, the question is, what's the role of a trade show in a world that has 24-7 information? In a world where, um, particularly where you're talking about digital contents, I understand we have an automotive show and you have to move all these big, you know, four-ton cars into an auditorium and people can compare them one against the other. But in the interactive entertainment world, you know, you don't necessarily have to go into a convention center and stand in line behind a kiosk to have a demo of a game. You can just see that right there uh, on your computer. So the the requirements and the expectations of the fan base are different. They want to get a look in. And they have, you know, PAX East, PAX West, Tokyo Game Show is a consumer show, Gamescom in Germany is a consumer show. But the idea of the show needed to be reinvented and the industry tried to do that you know started selling consumer tickets um to come to e3 i think they're like fifteen thousand and twenty thousand the next year to let them come in but the trouble with that the challenge with that is that fundamentally the way you design your presence at a trade show is completely different than how you design it for a consumer show right for a consumer show you're about throughput how many people can i put through here how fast and keep moving keep them going and pass them off to the next publisher and the next publisher. It's all about keep everybody happy and moving through the experience. A trade show is exactly the opposite. The trade show is you want to get the buyers and the media into your booth. And it's like Ikea. It's like make it hard for them to escape. <laughs> you know, keep them in, in, your, in your world, looking at your games, listening to your talking points. Um, which again, it's just the opposite of what a consumer show needs to be. So trying to mold them into one, I think, was a strategic error. The IKEA comparison is certainly interesting, um, but do you think that marketing budgets and the recent rise of digital presentations have also played a role in publishers just deciding to leave the event? I think those are good points, Michael, and those are both true. I think the fact that it's taking longer and more money to make the big AAA games that I'm associated with, that you weren't going to be introducing 12 new games a year or 15 new games a year you're going to have three or four really strong releases. And so where that lines up is June, the right time to tell that story. And for a lot of people, it was, just, it was the wrong timing. Earlier in the year, you can tell the story and sell the game into retail. If it's not ready, you wait till later in the year so you can get a pop right before holiday season um, to, to get the games out. June just seemed to be a, an odd time for that, from my point of view. I'm sure there are others who, who, feel, who feel differently. But that's what... Um, that's what kind of made E3 kind of uh, an odd timing place to be. And on top of that, to your point, um, let's be honest. If you're a chief financial officer and a large publisher, the pandemic, where on the one hand, you saw the gaming industry revenue grow by 20 to 24%, you know, during that time of people in lockdown, nothing else to do but play games. But the marketing budgets collapsed tremendously during that time. Um, even if you just look at travel entertainment, flying people around, going to events, that market budget dropped, but the revenue went up. So the profitability was quite significant. And if you go back to the world and people are saying, we need to go back to a trade show, which is a multi-million dollar commitment. Maybe you think, well, you managed to grow the business by 20% without a trade show. Um, how do you make the logic work that I need to spend this money and this event and this time to secure my business? You mentioned how major publishers aren't creating as many titles this year. I mean, your own Sony, you guys really focused on a handful of what you deemed as really high quality titles like God of War, Spider-Man, Days Gone. Um, but you've also been an advocate of the smaller title. You, mm -hmm. You've specifically mentioned Viv Ribbon as, as one in particular. That was seen in Astro's Playroom. I remember seeing that reference. Well, E3's disappearance affect such titles from being developed in the future. No, I don't think the the availability of an E3, have it or not, is going to affect what developers decide to make. Indeed, that was a time for particularly the small to middle-sized developers to get 
get some attention, get some love where maybe that's easier to come by when you're a large developer and you just say, I'm going to have a digital drop next weekend and, you know, show the world uh, 10 minutes of, um, of gameplay for the smaller ones. It's difficult to get an audience for that. But at the same time, you know, we're seeing gaming and Comic-Con now, you know, we have PAX East and PAX West. Uh, you can go to South by Southwest and you see independent game developers. It's bubbling up all throughout the fabric of American culture or world culture for that matter. So I think we're just going to see the platform's opportunities for the independent, independent developers to show their wares and they can show it online too. You know, they have access to, you know, discord and Twitch and YouTube and they can make that happen there. We're just going to have to find new avenues to, to get out in front of people, but they're very resilient. They'll find a way. So does the loss of E3 really mean anything then for the industry? Uh, certainly those of us who grew up with E3 have a very, you know, soft spot in our hearts, um, the sentimental piece. Uh, I like some of the stuff I'm seeing online, people talking about what's your favorite E3 memory. Um, I think it's just, I think they're going to try to resurrect it again next year. And I'll be interested to see how they do that. If they completely reimagine it. The one thing that always I felt was a lost opportunity to the E3 is that whilst it was held for the video game industry, we never really had an industry-wide message. You know, come to the video game industry trade show, you go open the doors, and it's just a bunch of standalone booths with loudspeakers and game kiosks and people moving around and people banging their pots and pans together saying, look at my thing, don't look at their thing. Um... But we never had a message around it. We never had this year's video game industry message is about, you know, accessibility through gaming. How do we bring more differently abled people into the gaming experience? We could have gotten around that as a message, made that, you know, this year's E3's thing as an industry together. But we never managed to quite get there with a cohesive message to tell people about the industry. So I guess E3's time has come. It was super important when we when it started. It remained pretty important over time but um everything changes well now with e3 considered by many as no longer viable a lot of people have turned to jeff Keeley's events as sort of the alternative you got summer games fest coming up you got the game awards in your mm -hmm. opinion are those suitable quote alternatives to the big expo i wouldn't so much call it an alternative but it's just different touch points where people can come out and you know, tell your story and, and show your game. And they happen in different times during the year, which is good because every game gestates at a different, you know, speed and time. And some games need a good place in the autumn to tell their story. And some games want to have some place in the early part of the year to tell that. So I think the proliferation, the more points we have to tell what's going on in our industry, is probably better than making everyone hold their breath for 12 months and wait for something to happen in Los Angeles. Now, you previously mentioned, you know, everyone's favorite E3 memory. What was your favorite E3 memory? Uh, or one, if you can't can't pick a favorite. Well, there, there are many. Um, I think the most notorious memory I have is, you know, the very first E3 where I was not physically there, but I saw that the, the head of PlayStation was they were all on stage to do their pre-E3 uh, press conference. And the PlayStation guys went up there and leaned into the mic and just said, 299 you drop the price point by a hundred dollars, like right there in, in the moment. And that was, that was pretty seismic. Um, my personal best E3 feeling was when we had that press conference in 2016 in the Shrine Auditorium. And I even said at the time, you know, I got to walk out on stage in front of an 80 piece orchestra conducted by Bear McCreary. And I just said, if any of you ever have the chance to do this, I recommend you do it. It's, um, it was the most amazing feeling in my life. So that's that's my personal E3 favorite story. I think a lot of people will echo the sentiment that Sony Z3 2016 was one of the best in in the industry as a whole. Is there anything else you remember from that day in particular? Well, it was everything all together. You know, we were in the Shrine Auditorium, which was a new place for us to set up. We'd been in the sports arena the previous eight or nine years, and that got torn down to make a soccer pitch. So we moved to the Shrine. It's a difficult theater to work with. It's, you know, 100 years of history. Um, but we came out in that moment and did the did the cold open with God of War and later on had Hideo Kojima walk down this Michael Jackson lighted staircase uh, to say that he's back. I got to finally announce Crash Bandicoot coming back. 
um, it was a it was a fantastic feeling that day. It was a really good day for us. Do those moments make the work leading up to it worth it, in your opinion? Oh, absolutely. And it is a lot of work. I mean, that's the other thing. You know, we look at the amount of work it takes to prepare for E3 and to execute E3. It almost takes three or four months of real work right out of your schedule. Because by the time February, March comes around, you're just all dedicated to that E3 moment. Um, you even have to stop building the main game. You have to build a demo, which may not be from the main game, but may be part of the main game. But you can't like use it back when you're done. Um, there's a lot of sacrifices you make in order to have a big splash at E3. And so at least now, without E3, it puts that time back in the calendar for the developers. Now, I want to rewind back to something you previously said. You said that there is a possibility that E3 comes back next year. Sure. Why in not? what way can can that happen? And are in-person events really something that the industry needs at the moment? I'll answer your second question first. I think yes. I think we've all had two, two and a half years of having very restricted association with other people, friends, family, and people in the industry. I think it's important um, as an industry to get together, uh, whether that's GDC or DICE or, or even E3 in some capacity, because you know, we all want, we're, we're a pretty social crowd and we all like to, you know, bounce ideas off each other. So that's good. I think it's good for people to have a hands-on experience, particularly the press. It's different if you can go in there and play a demo and have the developer there talking to you than just downloading code and playing a demo in your office. So I think those things are important. But I think what E3 has to decide is, are you going to be a trade show or be a consumer show? And be very intentional in that decision. Because... As my dad used to say, being in the middle of the middle of the road just means you get hit by cars going in both directions. <laughs> it's not a good place to be. So pick a lane and then lean right into it. If it's a consumer thing, then you know, take a look at what they do at PAX, take a look at what they do at Tokyo Game Show. Understand what that environment looks like to appeal to a wide consumer audience and be able to manage 40, 50,000 people on it, you know, daily. And if you're going to be a trade show, be intentional about that and um, and focus on what the business needs from all the other people in the industry and maybe start talking about what is a video game industry message. Can the industry come together around important developments or important initiatives in society and have a positive role to play? There is one, one more question I do want to ask you. I'm sure you're familiar with the PS4 used game video. A lot of people think this was shot behind closed doors at E3. A lot of people attribute it as the moment Sony, PlayStation, of course, the company you worked for, won the generation. Did you have anything to do with that video's creation? I was not back at PlayStation in 2014. I was still um, working as a chief operating officer of something called Sony Network Entertainment. We were managing um, the PlayStation Network. So I wasn't part of that decision-making process, but I was there to enjoy the moment. And how, how did you feel about that moment? I thought it was brilliant. It was just spot on, simple. Everyone understood it. That's, that's the best kind of video spot you can do that requires no explanation afterwards. Well, Sean, I'm sure there's so much more we can discuss, but I want to ask you, is there anything else you would like to add to this discussion? Is there anything I didn't ask you? No, there isn't, but I'm interested by all the attention that um, that E three still attracts, despite the fact that it's not happening. Um, there'll be stuff happening in LA that week. You know, Jeff's got something. I think EA may be doing their thing. Um, but you know, keep an eye on this. I think the industry has to decide how it wants to put its best foot forward um, going going forward. And um, yeah, never say never on things like E three. Once again, everyone. Sean Layden, the former chairman of SIE Worldwide Studios. Sean, thank you so much for being here with me today. Cheers, Michael. It was great.